Darkcast Network. Welcome to the Dark Side of Podcasts. Deep down, the toughest questions that we ask ourselves are the ones we already know the answers to. Hello and welcome to True Crime Connections Advocacy Podcast. This is where I talk to real people about real shit. I am Tiffany, your host, and if this is your first time here, I want to welcome you to our rewired and inspired community. If you are coming back, I am so happy that you're here. This week, we're going to learn how we can walk tall and unafraid. Today with me is guest Martina Grupo. She is the author, Hello Flower, and she is a narcissist survivor. So hi, Martina. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, Tiffany. It's an absolute pleasure. All the way over here in Italy, despite my accent, I am English and I am living in Italy, which might sound like a dream come true, but the reality is quite different when you're living here. Uh, yes, I'm delighted to be here. Sorry, don't you must stop me if I talk too much. <laughs> you are fine. Uh, Italy is actually on my bucket list, so really, as a place to visit, as a place to go yes. on holiday, hundred percent recommend it. Just don't move here. I think anywhere that you go on holiday is fantastic, isn't it? Because you're just there, and you 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 know you take away all the best bits. Um, it's hurt me a lot. So I think I've got a slightly more jaded view of it. And I think I'm ready to move, maybe not back to England, but maybe a move to sort of where my roots are, which is Southern Ireland. So, yes, I think a lot cooler, a lot more rainy. But, yeah, I'm, I'm all right. I'm not scared of that. No, you shouldn't be. Adventure, that's what life is all about. Finding yourself. And if you're not happy somewhere, you need to go find that happiness. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, I'm a really firm believer in that. If it's not right, change it, which is kind of ironic, because when you look at the whole subject of my book and everything, you'll be thinking, well, why didn't you move out of that? But I think that's where the whole thing about narcissism comes from. You don't realize that you can change it. You're so desperately trying to make something better that you don't realize that you should actually just walk away from it. And now I just threw myself right in there. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, that's perfect. That is absolutely perfect. Where did you meet your ex-husband? This is the point where I feel really like an absolute idiot. I actually met him twice. Uh, the first time was in my early 20s. And I think I set myself up for a huge fall there. Because I decided that I, we spent a couple of years together, hedonistic, fantastic, early 20s, you know, every, you've got the world at your feet, basically. It's just the most incredible sensation, living in Rome, just living the high life. And there came a point for me when I wanted more, as in I wanted, and we, we were in our mid-20s, I would say, and I just felt that I wanted, um, I wanted a little bit more stability. Well, I've always wanted stability and I wanted kids and a future and, you know, all those kind of things. And they come because I was sensible enough to know that they come with, I don't know, um, you have to do, you know, you have to make your dreams happen, don't you? So I wasn't just going to land the job of my dreams, no matter how much I wished for it. What I needed to do was to go and study. So I wanted to go back to England and he didn't. And I think that's where I made my first big mistake, not leaving Italy. I think that was a very good thing to do and a very sensible option to go back to university at 26 years old and, you know, take that degree and everything else. But along with moving back to Italy, I carried not just the baggage onto the plane, but all the baggage of that failed relationship on my shoulders. Because he said to me, oh, yes, you must go back to Italy. You must, sorry, you must go back to England you know, that's the right thing for you. I don't want to go back, but you need to do what makes you happy. 
said in the most altruistic, selfless way, I just took it all on. It To me, that was me that had made a hugely selfish move and had left the best thing, you know, my soulmate, the one person who would have made me happy. So I carried that for quite a few years. Lots of things happened, which included, you know, various different jobs, another marriage, my first marriage, IVF, an attempt at IVF. But um, my first husband walked out of that. So, you know, the whole infertility thing was was really difficult for me to cope with during that time. And then the divorce from my first husband. And then out of nowhere, like a sparkly unicorn, my wonderful Prince Charming reappears on the horizon. And he sends me this message when, long story, I can't go into this now, but I was in Nicaragua because I was buying coffee whole other sort of business yeah I know you should read the book and I went and he he contacted me and my legs gave way there he was you know this this is the person that I had been waiting for the person that I knew a person whose photographs and messages and drawings I had put into an envelope in my you know I'm, I'm buried somewhere in in some old boxes or something too too upset to even open it and look at you know this person that i personally felt responsible for having lost i know what an idiot anyway he appears on the horizon you know on his sort of you know, he was scared of horses so he wouldn't have been on a horse he came along and on his donkey yeah <laughs> on his air <laughs> no we shouldn't laugh what we should but later maybe what he did was he came along and and made me believe in this fairy tale and I well he didn't make me believe in it I believed in it and then he embarked on the textbook list of behaviors which narcissists do so he started out with the love bombing oh my god I can't believe it's you you're amazing do you still do this do you still have that I can't wait to see you it's always been you and for somebody who's quite vulnerable after the infertility the divorce I didn't really get on with my some members of my family you know there was some of this that just made me feel right now it's my turn Okay, now I'm going to get the happy ever after that I've always dreamed about. It might not be accompanied by cute little kids running around, but I will have my love story. I will have the person that I'm supposed to be with. And then he just began, wow. I mean, then I I think it started pretty quickly. Over an 11-year period, he started to tear me down. And I am... I'm not torn down easily. I've got been described as feisty and willful and probably quite annoying sometimes, but you know, and I'm fairly determined. But he, yeah, I, I, the, the, the destroying of somebody is really difficult and it's insidious because when it's done by somebody you love and, you know, somebody you've held up up here, you can't even, I think the reason why you, don't walk away, as we were saying at the very beginning. The reason you don't, you don't change it is because that person is also telling you that it's all your fault. You know, you're menopausal, you're putting on weight, your hair's too curly, your hair's too straight, that t shirt isn't, I mean, just everything. And I know, Tiffany, probably. I know that this has been far more prevalent in America, at least the highlighting of it has come to the fore in America. And you use the term narcissistic abuse and narcissism. I didn't know anything. I didn't even know. As far as I was concerned, that was somebody who looked in the water in a Greek, you know, mythology thing. And, and, you know, and then he fell in and drowned and more fooled him because he was vain. That was it. You know, to find out that there are, there are, dictionary definitions there there's a whole vocabulary that accompanies what these people do um i mean i you know gaslighting wow gaslighting that's you know harsh it's basically somebody trying to make you feel crazy and yes i was told constantly i was crazy and you know what i was right about everything that i was crazy about so it's also really difficult because they've already set the groundwork 
if he had come in at the very beginning and had gone through the love bombing stage and then the mirroring and the copying and the everything you like, I like, everything you do, I love, you know, that kind of thing, we fought for it, don't we? Because you're just like, this is finally the man for me. He finally gets me. But if they had, if they then went straight on to the gaslighting stage, we would be, whoa, no, hang on a second. You know, you're not doing that to me. And what they do is something which is, it's the second stage. God, I always forget the name of this and it's really annoying. It's the, it's, it's the tearing down of you. It's the negging. It's making you feel bad about yourself and making you doubt, you know, things like the nicest t-shirt on you or the best you know thing that you want to wear or what you want to eat or you're cooking or something what they're doing is they're starting to make that all crumble and by crumbling the part of you that is really strong and believes in what you're doing they're very cleverly laying a manipulative foundation for when they come on in and gaslight you and then you know that's when that's when it's really like yeah, one nil. I've got you. There's nothing I can do because I'm actually making you doubt your own reality. God, yeah. They're very strategic. Very. Because they know they well, have I, to well, get I, you where they want you. I'm going to interrupt you. Strategic makes them sound clever. I don't think they're clever at all. I think that they have a textbook way of treating people and they never deviate from that. And when I when they become transparent, when you can actually see what they're doing, then, then you can start laughing at them. Then you can re I mean, uh, you know, I was blown away by some of the stuff that he just said in front of me before I even knew about all of this. You know, the term pathological liar was created, obviously, for these type of people. But you think pathological lying pathologically? No, nobody does that. So do they do it I mean to your face absolutely to I mean I actually had, he's such an arsehole but you know there was when I think about it there was one there was one time when I was kind of testing him because I knew I was leaving I knew it was you know it was just a question of time before I'd leave and he was earning a pittance because in 11 years I think he worked maybe one total that's how much he manipulated me. You know? And I worked about three or four jobs just to maintain us, to keep us going. I paid for everything. I started going through my savings. Yeah, it was it was dreadful. So he got this job, which he told everybody that he had a part ownership in this booty bed and breakfast in Rome. Yeah, no, he didn't. He was cleaning the rooms. I've got nothing against anybody that cleans rooms. It's absolutely 100% okay, but not when you're telling everybody else something entirely different. And he right. came back one weekend because he used to leave me on my own for like five, six days of the week because he was so busy. But anyway, he came in and, and he said, oh, should we go out for lunch? And I said, yeah, yeah, let's go out for lunch. And I looked at him and I said, are you paying? And he actually did that gesture. Oh, no, I've left all my money. And I just went, oh, well, we won't be going out for lunch then, will we? <laughs> Good for you. I, I, yeah, I, I did a lot of things. Anyway, so that's that was, see, I've gone off on a tangent. I warned you about this. <laughs> no, it's fine because that is financial abuse and that is part of it. And I totally understand because when I went through my abusive relationships, there also were not all these words. I had no idea. I just thought, wow, like, what is wrong with me not see through this shit? And then all of a sudden, all of these terms came out and it was like an aha moment. And you're like, holy shit, there's a name for it. I will never forget before I left, it was a friend of mine who said to me, and that people who've been through this are really quiet because we feel ashamed. Okay. We feel ashamed that we've allowed this to happen. And she hadn't come out and told me before, but she said, I saw you at Christmas and I saw, you know, I was like a shell of myself. I wasn't smiling. I was scared. And it was, it was, it was horrible. And she said to me, I need you to look up. I don't know if he is one, because that's what we always say to other people, isn't it? Like, I'm not sure if he is, or I'm not sure if that's the way they're behaving, but just check it out and see if any of this lines up. 
And she started mentioning some of the traits. And I was like, yeah, yeah. And I said, okay, what I'll do is I'll, I'll go away and I'll read about it. And I found a paper by a psychologist, a proper scientific paper. And I'll never forget, I just sat and read it on my phone and shouted through the phone down. And I was, and I was just like, this is his biography. You know, <laughs> this is a malignant narcissist. This is what he is. I don't need to go and have him diagnosed. He has exhibited all of this behavior up until that, yeah, up until now. But the problem that we, as the people who are in this relationship, have is that what we go through is a form of trauma bonding. And even after I left him, I didn't believe that I, you know, and I hadn't had any proof. I suspected that he was having lots of affairs or he had somebody else. It was only when I started writing about it. But then I started to go back and I realized it had been going on for years, you know, just even our wedding day, I'm pretty sure he, yeah, he disappeared for four hours. I mean, that's the kind of treasure I married. (laughs) Um, He was cleaning rooms, okay? I know, I was incredibly lucky. You know that he got towards the end of the relationship and, you know, and I didn't care anymore I was I mean I did care of course you care because you're 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 blindsided by how awful they are you know you really are just thrown by the whole thing and I was a shell of myself it's taken me a good couple of years to come back up I must tell you about something you mustn't let me don't let me forget that I want to tell you about my substack thing because there was a video and you can see exactly what I looked like when I was with him towards the end and what I look like now and it's, wow, it's like I've written an article about it and I've actually written the sentence. It's like Benjamin Button. I've, I've gone backwards. I mean, that just looks like an old woman in that thing, you know, all proud and everything. Now I forgot what I was going to say. That's really annoying. Um, towards the end, I remember him sitting there exactly from what you just said. And I just said, you know, because... Oh, that's another really important thing. Grey rocking. Okay, you'll have heard the term grey gray rocking. Have you ever heard of it? I am not familiar with that one. Wow. Okay, so grey rocking, probably the opposite. What a narcissist feeds off is your emotion. Okay? So that then enables them to go around saying to everybody that you're a hysterical, crazy, uncontrollable, wild you know, stupid woman who's accusing them of of all of this, because remember, they remain as the victim. Okay, they are always the victim. Always. Yeah. So when you start yelling and shouting and going, what bloody hell is going on here? Or why are you doing this? Or all of that. Then they just sort of stand back and they're like, oh, look, here she is again. Little Miss Nutcase. So at that point, you're feeding them. In fact, there's a great meme which is called showing uh, a narcissist any emotion is like bleeding next to a shark. Yeah, I know. I love that. But I love that too. Absolutely. (laughs) Grey rocking is the opposite. And if you shut down and give them nothing and treat them as though they are, they have nothing for you and you are nothing. To, you, do you know what, do you know what I mean? You become as insignificant as they are insignificant as a gray rock. So you give them nothing, no emotion whatsoever. So he came back and I said, well, I'm filing for separation. This is how it's going to work. And, and he said, oh, his favorite one was, well, you always do what you want to do. If only. If only I'd always done what I wanted to do. I'd have left a long, long time before. But the the um, the way that I was, it was almost as if I had just stopped feeling. So I didn't show him any emotion. And I said, no, I understand that. But please tell me, tell me what it is that you think that you've done to save this marriage. You know, anything, just one thing. What have you done to save this marriage? And his answer was, I got a job. <laughs> I'm so grateful you got a job that puts you in the same city as your girlfriend and six days of the week away from me. I didn't say any of that to him. It doesn't matter. You know, none of that matters. But 
that's that's how little they have. And that's what I mean. They're not the cleverest people by any stretch of the imagination. They're certainly the most manipulative. But you can leave. You can get out. There is a way out to be a better and a stronger person. And, you know, and if they preyed on you in the first place, I don't want to say that they will play paying you a compliment, but nine times out of ten, a narcissist will go from somebody that he can steal from physically, mentally, emotionally. It means that you are the strong one. You are the one with everything. And they're the ones that want everything that you've got until you disappear. That took me a long time to figure out because I always thought like they could tell that obviously I must have had low self-esteem or, you know, because I always say you could be in a crowded room and they could pick you out. But it took me a while to realize it's because they saw that they had something to gain by you. There's a purpose for you. It's whatever they're going to get out of it. It's what they need. You see, because on their own, they don't sparkle. You are sparkling. And they're magpies, well, nasty versions of magpies, and they want whatever you have. What is it in, is there a Harry Potter book where they talk about Dementors? Have you ever read any of the Harry Potter books? I haven't read them, but I watched the movies and I love the rides at Universal. Well, they have Dementors, okay? So there's a creature, mm-hmm. that's, they suck your energy. That's what a narcissist is. And there's, an, there's something else, whereas in England, I think people, and in U- Europe less so, because the word, you know, resonates. But in England, I think people are getting a little bit fed up with the idea of, oh, narcissist is just another label for bad behavior. You try and say to somebody, I went through an abusive relationship where he used coercive control. And suddenly people are like, shit, that's bad. It's the same thing. The problem is that people will label everybody as a narcissist. and. Yes. And are doing. Yes. I mean, it could be some guy cut line or something and some, oh, they're a narcissist. Like, no, not everybody is a narcissist. <laughs> exactly. And not everybody who lies is, ga- and they're not gaslighting you if they lie. Oh, he lied to me. I know I'm being gaslit. No, you're not. No, you are not. Because by the time anybody can get around to gaslighting you, you are already a shadow of your former self. I'm, old, I'm older now. Okay, so I'm learning not to go, no, that's not true. (laughs) I've had an awful lot of people try to tell me, you know, what it is like. But the people who don't try and tell me what it's like are the ones that have lived through a proper relationship like this. And when I say proper, I mean a, a properly abusive, not a proper relationship. It wasn't a proper relationship at all, but a properly abusive relationship when when you really are brought to your knees and almost destroyed. Because, I mean, I know we're laughing and joking about all of this and I'm out, but there are people out there who are putting up with this and thinking that this kind of behaviour is normal. Because I did. You know, people would say to me, well, you know, he didn't he didn't do this or he didn't do that. And, and I think, yeah, okay, so he can be a bit of an arsehole, but he's my arsehole. But it wasn't. And, and do you know what that made me? His A1 best wingman. He could get away with anything because he knew that I would be there defending him. Right. So from the first time you were with him to the second time, did he not have those behaviors the first time around? Or was it that maybe he felt he had a deeper grip on you and then could start showing more? I think the first time around, he didn't work at all. But because we were so young, you know, we were in our mid-20s and you're following this sort of lifestyle where I was working in a bar, I was also a babysitter, I was doing all sorts of things in Italy, in Rome, you know, piecemeal work wherever I could find it, that it all felt very much like everybody was trying to get by that way. So I think any red flags or warning signs or anything like that, they didn't show up as much because everybody's young and good looking and lovely. And it's all about the clothes and the parties and the alcohol and the rest and all of that. And you don't stop and think until you stop and think. And then you say, I actually need better in my life than this. And that's when you you 
go away to find a better life. And that's when he didn't come with me. The warning signs were there very much from the beginning of the second time I was with him. But I brushed them off because this was my second chance at happiness. So there was no way that I was going to allow a little thing like him not having employment, him not having his own house him not, you know, having any kind of a career or something, because he was very plausible when he told me about all the things he had tried to do. And he did work for 10 years, allegedly. You see, now I don't know any of that, because I just, you know, as far as I was concerned, it was his ex-girlfriend who supported him for 10 years, just as I did. And he he did some, some things. So he did some part of that work. But I think she carried him along the same way I was about to carry him along. For 11 years. I can see that. One of mine didn't work for like a year. And I was a single mom raising my my son. And on the weekends, he would be like, I haven't left the house all week. Like, we need to go do something. And I'm like, I barely had two nickels to rub together. And it's like, but I've been sitting in this house all week. Okay, go get a damn job. Tiffany, if then, you, oh my God, if you do not read my book, because you are literally, there is a chapter in there that I was the same working in a school all week. And he came back and said, aren't we going to do something this weekend? And I was doing private lessons as well, everything to try and pay private tuition lessons, everything to pay for it. End of the, the Friday night when I was exhausted. Well, what are we doing this weekend? Like you, yeah, exactly the same. No, you're good. I was pawning my jewelry so I could have the extra money to keep him happy so we could go bowling or we could do something stupid to get him out of the house. Because you had to please him, because if you didn't please him, then he would react like a hysterical toddler. I was gonna say toddler, yes. (laughs) Oh, absolutely on that's just so mm-hmm. awful. do you know what we're laughing at this because we've got through it but it's just it's so sickening isn't it just to hear that you and I've met so many people who have gone through the same thing people who have contacted me to say this is horrendous you know I can literally see my whole life developing as yours did I have to leave him. And you just want to reach out and say, it's not you. It's just not you. It's them. Right. You have to know when you finally had enough. And, you know, they say it takes about seven times to finally leave somebody. And I got to say, I probably stuck out all those seven times and I kept going back because it was comfortable. It was familiar. He was my dream guy in my eyes. I thought he was like God's gift. You know, he looked like he belonged on the corner of G or on the cover of GQ. So I was like, oh my God. And he wants me. It was more of a pride thing, I think as well. Like, look at what I got. What I didn't realize. Was he humble? Was he, did he come across, was he like a a sort of, you know, did people generally like him? Uh, It's funny you should ask that. Men did not, he did not have very men, like many, let's try that again. He did not have very many male friends. He had all female friends. Right. So, and I could see him using them on the side. Like he would get whatever he could get out of them. Right. And That kind of got the wheels kind of turning in my head a little bit. So he had quite a lot because my ex-husband had a lot of transient friends. So he would meet somebody. Oh, my God, they were the best thing since sliced bread. They're so loved. And then weeks later, there would be no interest. Oh, no, I don't see them anymore. Oh, no, they treated me this way because, no, I got, you know, I don't need to see them. And it was really strange because I just thought, wow. You know, you were all over that person. Well, he was probably literally all over that person. Yeah. (laughs) Well, mine was a bartender. So he met all kinds of people at work. And then he told me he didn't want me in bars, but that's where you work. So I was very confused. I can't be in a bar, but you can work in one. Like, okay, that makes sense. It 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 is one rule for one and another rule for another. 
And also that that the other thing to look out for if you're in a relationship like this, which I really, I feel so bad for you, is the projection. I was accused of being money obsessed, controlling, work obsessed. Um, I had no friends. I didn't ever want to go out. I wanted to go out. You know, whatever suited him, whichever rhetoric suited him at the time, he would accuse me of that. Are you having an affair when he clearly was? You know, you're so money obsessed. He used to say, all you want to do is just work, work all the time. You never want to go out anywhere. But if I suggested going out anywhere, he'd say, oh, no, I'm much happier staying at home. It was it was the most, it was like walking the last few years were like walking in a hall of mirrors. You didn't know which way to turn. You didn't know what you were supposed to say, do, wear, anything. It was just, yeah, it was unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. I still can't believe I was in it. I still can't believe, you know, even people who know me really well. It's really difficult to explain to somebody who's in a normal relationship because they just said, and I understand why they ask it, why didn't you just leave? I don't know. It's not that easy. It's just not. A part of you honestly is in love with this person you're in love with the idea of the person you want them to be but you're also you are convinced that it is because it's your fault that you can if you just do this things will go back to the way they were at the very beginning if I just make a better effort if I just cook him this if I just buy him that then things are going to go back to the way they were it's a form of brainwashing and it oh, takes for sure. a long time remove yourself from that mentality. When I left him and I, I, you know, I came to live here and this place was a building site and I remember, you know, doing things. I would have his, it was like a channel in my head, like a radio channel. No, you, you shouldn't do that. No, you don't want to do that. No, you need to double check this. And you'd have to almost like, sh- no. Quick, turn the channel, put some music on, dance, do anything, you know, just get rid of that damn voice because it's really annoying. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. When I sit back and think about my instances, because I've dated two complete assholes. <laughs> oh, I've know, dated it's... loads of assholes, but two narcissists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just, I'm like, how many times were you going to fall for the same shit? And, you know, I would look through his phone here and there. Like he kept his phone with him all the time, all the time. So if he went to the bathroom and we were out, he took his phone. So anytime he left it on the table, I was always like poking at it. Cause obviously, you know, there's a code on it, but just to see the notifications. And every time I'd always find something always. And then when you ask them about it, it's now your fault because you went looking for something. So I used to get told, well, if you're going to look for something, you're going to find it. What the fuck does that mean? It, but in actual fact, that's just them putting it straight back onto you. You see, I wasn't as savvy as you were because I trusted him 100%. If there was one thing I didn't think he was doing, it was sleeping with other people. God, I could tell you some horror stories. Honestly, but I won't. It's not right for radio. But, you know, even with his phone beeping all the time, beeping left, right and centre during the evening, during at night. And I would say, why is your phone keep coming off? And then he'd be angry with me because I'd woken him up because they were messaging him. And it, it was just so bizarre that I never grabbed hold of his phone and just went through it and said, right, OK, we're done. I don't know what it is that makes you, that stops you from just checking he was very good I guess it was because I didn't want want to believe it I suppose you don't want the answers no I suppose it's that but 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 they do and they all do and they're all doing it you know oh for sure it doesn't matter how much it is like that became my life you don't even understand like now the phone became like an obsession because every time I checked it I did find something And it's like, I couldn't live like that anymore. I'm like, what kind of life is this? So why didn't you leave leave when you saw? Because I, right, okay. So now I'm going to interview you. Because I told you why I, or how I got out. 
Now, you had two. I don't think my first husband was a narcissist. I think he showed narcissistic tendencies. But I don't think he was actually one. But I think my, but I, I still think he was a, a dickhead. But I want to know, how did you get out of the first one and the second one? How do you stop yourself from falling into a third one? So the first one was actually my son's father and that he's like maybe Mm. on the cusp of a narcissist and maybe a psychopath. (laughs) So when obviously I got pregnant, I couldn't drink. I couldn't hang out anymore. And Uh, when that happened, you really see the full picture. And he went out every night, every night of my pregnancy, except for two nights. And thank God one of them was the night I went into labor. So I never knew what was going to come home. And that was frightening to me because you just never knew. He was very mean. He was a mean, mean, mean drunk. And so I wouldn't sleep. I'd be a nervous wreck. And I actually passed that on to my son, which, you know, he has anxiety issues now. And back then, I didn't even take that into accountability that everything that I was feeling he was feeling. And that was a hard pill for me to swallow. Enough, enough is enough. And so I left him when my son was a month old. I stayed away ever since because clearly you have issues. That's an incredibly brave thing to do. The second one, he moved in with me after a month. Yeah. The red flag, y'all. Red flag. So you have the love bombing. You're the best thing that's ever happened to me. I'm going to take care of you both. Okay. Right. Right. And then I think he lost his job. I met him while he was bartending. So I had to hear that all through the relationship too. Well, that's how you met me. That's how, you know what I mean? You can't get mad that I'm a bartender. That's how you met me. And it's like, my God. Yes. That's yeah. Turns it all around. It's all your fault. Of course. God, they really are unimaginative. And I kept finding things. So one day I was at the bar with my mom and a bartender at a place he used to work came up to me and told me, so you go to bed about 1030 every night and he's in here around 11 o'clock every time when he's in here, because he would leave when I would go to bed and because I worked in the morning like a normal person. And so, you know, he was still on that night shift brain and she's like, he's in here with girls all the time, all the time. Well, I got so pissed off. I went home. It was my house. I threw all his shit on my front lawn. How long had you been with him? At that point, probably about a year. So you got out quite quickly. Yes. I put everything that he owned on my front lawn. And then I took a picture of it and said, look, who's having a yard sale? It's like 1 a.m. I kept the picture, I still have it, of all of his shit right in front of my house. I said, you better come get it before other people start picking through it. What did he do? So after that, I tried to like get my door with a chair and all kinds of stuff so he couldn't get in because I still had his big screen TV and his dog. Those were the only two things I still had of his. And then I went to my mom's because I'm like, I'm running. I'm getting out of here. Well, when I returned the next day, I found out he broke into my house through the back door and he got his TV. He got his dog and kind of like ransacked the house, took whatever of mine he thought that he deserved and kind of went on and did his own stuff for a little while. Well, a part of me was still fascinated with this man. It was like a lust thing. I don't, I don't know what it was. I just, I felt like he was above me for some reason and how lucky am i that he wanted me okay and worst mentality to ever ever be in so that was a really hard thing for me to kind of digest because Mm -hmm. especially like i was saying earlier turned out i was i was so much better than him and he knew that that's why he targeted me Yes, but the second that you started to feel as though he was superior was the moment that he wasn't interested in you anymore because you'd served your purpose and he couldn't get anything else from you. Well, he could also, it's, really, it's also, you did give him back, you took him back. A couple oh, times. 
Absolutely. No. The only, the only thing I would say is, okay, so you discovered quite earlier on and you ignored the red flags. For me, I mean, I was going through, I also went through cancer when I was with him. So I had breast cancer and then the menopause, which apparently, according to him, doesn't exist. Did you know that? I just want you to know that the menopause apparently doesn't exist. It's a figment of our imaginations. But, you know, you said that you felt that it was lust. Okay. well, he made me feel as though I was just like his mate. You know, I had no I I felt asexual next to him. But actually, I wasn't too worried because he was so shit in bed that actually I wasn't missing out on anything. And it is not true that Italians do it better. No, they don't. Okay. Just going to put that out there. He was the most selfish, self-obsessed crap kisser. You know, why? Why was I with him for 11 years? What? Where? I don't know. Anyway. Okay. Well, I never lived with him again. I made sure you are never stepping foot in my house. You are never taking advantage of me ever again. <laughs> it's going to be like a year and a half in, I want to say, that I did all that. And then we had a couple months apart and then they just start creeping back in. They leave like little breadcrumbs and they start getting back in your good graces. And remember when we used to do this and remember when we did that, look at all the fun we had. Look at all this. Like, I miss you. You are my soulmate. And I'm like, you don't treat your soulmate like this. And like, I would always say that. And like, even towards the end, Every time I'd go back, I was so miserable because I knew that this is not where you should be. Mm. So it used to be like, you're so hot and cold because like a part of me wanted him. But another mm. part of me was like, girl, what are you doing? You know, so it was because, you know, because, you know, don't you? Oh, I knew. I, knew. I, knew. I, I was trying to work it out. And I was thinking to myself, I would go for walks on the beach with his dog who, by the way, he abandoned. So I took over his dog that he'd wanted so much and was such a, he was was quite thankful. He was a great Dane and took him and looked after him. And I'd go for walks on the beach going, what is wrong? What is wrong? What is wrong? Until I realised, you know, I didn't realise that he was a narcissist, but I was just, the, the, the light bulb moment was he never invests in anything. He never invests, whether it's, houses, jobs, or any, he's not, or people, he does not invest in anything. He's just coasting. He's cruising through this. Verbiage. Yes. Yes. Coasting. Yeah. That's why, I I mean, I, I just, I'm really, really, the other thing that I I described in it is for a long, long time, when you're in a long-term relationship, and I wrote about this, you know, the plastic wrapping you get at uh, airports, you know, those bag wraps where they wrap your bag in the plastic over and over and over again so that nobody can open them when you, when you travel. You ever seen those? I don't think we do that here. No, I've seen it in America. You do. You go and they put them on a revolver and they've got this plastic thing and it just goes round and round like cling film. You know, like the cling film you use to cover dishes and things. And it goes round and round and round and round and round until the whole of the thing is, is barely recognisable. Your suitcase is barely recognisable. I've never done it. It doesn't strike me as being particularly sustainable. But anyway, you're all ethical, all of this plastic. That's how I felt. I felt like I had been completely bound up to the point that I wasn't allowed to say anything, that anything I said was wrong, that anything I did was wrong. And I could feel myself towards the end of it pushing against this and just wanting to be heard. And it was, yeah, I, anyway, it's two and a half years now. And I'm out. Yes, it's been a while for me too. The scars are still there though. Like I was constantly told I was ugly, fat, gross. Nobody would want me. That all of his friends would say, why are you with her? Like just very mean things. And so oh, it took me a long time monkeys. to work through all that. Flying monkeys. Flying monkeys believe <laughs> everything everybody says. So I am, in no particular order, a hysterical, drug-addled, alcoholic, work-obsessed, controlling lesbian who doesn't like sex and only wants to be on her own. I don't like sex with you. That's fine. You know, obviously. Or well, you can see just by looking at me how miserable I am. I mean, in the end of the day, you got to look at it and be like, they did us a 
favored is this because I was able to find my true identity and what I was willing to put up with. And that was not it. I think you're great, but I'm going to disagree with you. That's fair. I think that despite them, our true selves reared their heads from something that we were being pushed into quicksand for a long, long time. And we fought back and went, actually, I'm not having this. Not because of them, but in spite of them. And I, I really believe that the strength of the people that they pick is in there. And anybody listening to this, please know you do have the ability to get out. And it is better out there. Oh, my God. Tiffany, you have to check my Substack page. Seriously. I'm going to send you the link after this because it's it's the video makes me cry. When I, when I see that video and it shows me, he's taking film of me when I, in the last year that we were together, when I bought this place and I'm wandering around, you know, trying to be happy because the video is for my friends to show them, you know, look, I've bought this place and it's going to be great and everything else. It's a very, you know, it's a very basic video. And then there's the second one, which was taken in July of this year. And it's like somebody has changed them, even though they're both in colour. It's like the second one is in colour and the first one's in black and white. And it's just, yeah, I love it. I really do. But yeah, yeah I want to see for sure. I've loved this. This has been really, really great. And I am, I am so much better than I was. I, it's a work in progress because like you say, and I often use this similarity which is all metaphor which is if you cut a tree it's got rings running all the way through it you know those rings that show how old it is I think if you cut me in half you'd see the trauma abuse the effects of it running all the way through it through me and I still react badly to certain things I you know you would say triggering if something can just it doesn't happen often and I'm learning to control it but oh my God, when it does, I can be right back there and walking on eggshells again. And I don't need to be overjoyed and happy and bouncing around and off the walls all of the time. But nothing makes me happier than having my own peace. You know, just not having somebody come along and wreck it. That's, I think, makes me the most happy. Just, you know, and even if it means just hanging out in my beanbag or in my hammock and listening to an audio book for an hour, then I will do that. And I have the right to do that. Nobody can take it. Absolutely. Yeah, Yeah, well, and, and, you know, it's good. And how is your son? Is your son okay now? Is he better? Yeah. I mean, he has anxiety, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. So he tries to work on that a little bit. But for the most part, He's good. He is old enough now to realize that his father's batshit crazy. So, well, he saw the wrath of it because, unfortunately, he hasn't completely changed. So, when he would stop drinking for a while, and then when he would drink, like, of course, it'd be me and my son who's getting 70 text messages in a row of how you did this and you deserve this and murp, murp, murp. And so, I mean, but other than that, he's doing great. I'm, I'm very really delighted. I'm really pleased to hear that. That sounds so cool. Really. Yes. Cool. So your book, it's available on Amazon? It is. Look, I'm so proud of my book. Honestly, I really am. I want everybody, I want the whole world to read it. I didn't write it. Earn a load of money and become a millionaire and just sit in a house somewhere. And I just want to carry on writing. But that book was written for anybody going through this. I love writing. And and I wrote that. And I'm so chuffed that people have said that they couldn't put it down, that some people have read it in a couple of days. And yeah, I'm I'm incredibly proud of it. And I will send you a couple of copies. I will. Perfect. I am so happy for you and I'm proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm all right. Is there anything I'm else good. you wanted to add? God, we'll have to do another one. <laughs> I, need food. I need a glass of wine. It's like, you know, come on. It's 25 past eight here. It's way <laughs> more. <laughs> oh, 
Well, we can always do that. I'm always down for a round two, so. Definitely. But see, well, let's see if anybody has got questions or anything like that through this, but I would love to see you again. It's been a real pleasure. Of course. Is there any special links that you want me to put in the show notes other than for the book, like social media? Substack. 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 Okay. I will make sure I put that in there. Thank you so much. Of course. And to the listeners, if you know anybody who could benefit from this episode, please share it with them. This is a safe space. That's what we do this for. And if you have any questions, comments, you want to be on the show, I want to hear from you too, especially if any of these episodes resonate with you. Like It's so important for us to know what we're doing is helping people. So we need to keep being rewired and inspired until next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Of course. Thank you.